am Femi OK. You're watching the stream. On this episode, we are spending a full 25 minutes with George Mpanga, also known as the spoken word artist, George the Poet. Hello, George. Great to have you on the stream. Hello. Thank you very much, Femi. Uh, it's great to be here. I am, I am thinking, George, that there were going to be times when you create content, you do performances for audience who know you. They know your work. So there's a shorthand with talking to them. And there'll be other times where you know you're speaking to a much broader audience who don't know you, your background. How do you introduce yourself to people who are discovering you, even people who are discovering you right now in this conversation? I tell people that I'm a spoken word artist and I tend to talk about political um, and social questions in my work. Mm. We are opening this conversation up. We have comments from young people in Uganda. We have comments on Twitter and comments right here in the YouTube comments page. If you want to talk to George the Poet, you are very welcome to jump into the comments section and you can be part of our conversation. We are particularly talking about a new film called Black, Yellow, Red, which we'll get to in a moment. If you've got questions about that, they get straight to the top of the queue. George, I'm thinking about you growing up as a youngster and uh, I grew up as a, a black Brit from the African diaspora. You're a son of the diaspora, son of the Ugandan diaspora. What moments as a youngster were you acutely aware that you were Ugandan? Well, I was, um, I was raised in the Jamaican community, the only Ugandan family in mm. our neighborhood and um, the Jamaicans had been there for some generations and they had a different relationship with the country to what my parents had. So really in my friends and their families, I was already aware that our Ugandan experience was different to what most people in the country um, identified with. Right, I'm looking here at a picture of you as a youngster, um, this is about 10 years ago, and you as a budding artist, how yeah. did you know, <laughs> how did you know that there would be an audience for what you were doing? Did it even matter? Well, the audience came from rap music in the first place. Uh -huh. And we had the good fortune of being able to record ourselves with home technology for the first time when I started out as a rapper. So that was my introduction into what I'm doing now. One of the things um, and pieces of work that you've become very well known for is a podcast. And uh, your podcast has been hugely successful. You've got awards for it. And there was a moment where you wanted to celebrate on the anniversary of the podcast, what the podcast actually was there to do. Let's have a listen to that clip. But when it comes to this beautiful, resilient, overlooked, traumatized community. I got skin in the game. I got 27 years of experience. So no matter what stories come up in the papers about our trigger happy gangland or our state dependent single mums, I remember everything firsthand. In fact, we all do. So why is it that we as a community have no control over our narrative? Our main storytellers are rappers, but the rappers of today are facing the same struggles N.W.A. did around the time I was born. How? Housing, schools, crime, unemployment, is that it? We now provide the fuel for a multi-billion dollar storytelling industry, and all we have to show for it is new versions of the same story. Have you heard George's podcast? As George was listening to himself, he was smiling. Why were you smiling? You're listening to yourself. Because it's really personal for me. You know, the things I'm saying um, are my innermost thoughts uh. and really my hopes and my dreams. So the, the podcast was always the vehicle I used to communicate some of these ideas to as many people as possible. There's some moments where I know as, as an artist, as a creator, that they are going to be milestone moments in your career. Uh, and there are moments when people discover you. If you could name one or two where you thought, 
that was that was a milestone where more people knew about my work or that was a breakthrough for me. What would some of those milestones be for you, George? Well, a few years ago, I wrote a poem for the royal wedding between um, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. A lot of people turned on to me from that moment. Um, mm. A few years before that, I opened the Rugby World Cup in, in 2015. Um, with my own poem. People might know me from that. I've been the face of a few global ad campaigns because I write poems um, in collaborations with brands. And, um, you know, fortunately, many of those poems get broadcast across the world. So there's been a few moments, I guess. There's some comments here on YouTube. I, I, I really love this. It, it feels like you're, you've got a, a big family of fans out there. We've got Gabrielle. Hi, George. Shout out from Birmingham, UK. Born and raised in Uganda. Very proud of you. I want to play here a clip from Black, Yellow, Red. Before I do that, explain what this new short film is about and the significance of the date. Okay, well, Black, Yellow, Red was released on the 14th of January 2021, just a month ago now. And that's the date that I turned 30. It's mm -hmm. also the date of the Ugandan presidential elections this year. And both of these are big moments. They were on my mind for obvious reasons. And they just, the moment gave me a, a time of reflection. That coincidence allowed me to reflect on 10 years of George the Poet mm -hmm. and also what um, the, the presidential race between the incumbent, President Museveni, and the opposition leader, Bobby Wine, what that taught me or what that reinforced mm -hmm. for me about politics and the role of art in creating change. What stand, stands out for me and what stood out for me was how you talked about leadership in Uganda in a very memorable way. Let's have a listen. Let's have a look. There's a faction of Ugandan society whose reaction is angry and violent, who can't stand being silent. But then there's another perspective. See, what does it take to govern effectively? One school of thought would say the rule of law. But not all Ugandans feel like that, given what the country's gone through before. Tribal persecution, a gruesome war. Well, 70 came to power in the 80s, and as of 2018, 80% of Ugandans were under 35. Yeah, you heard me right, 35. They've never experienced another leader, and whoever that could be can't actually prove they've got the requisite experience to govern either. In fact, the other day Museveni gave a speech and the way he addressed the country was particularly candid. Bazukulu, literally, grandkids. Bear in mind, Bobby Wine's 36. He hasn't really had to win popularity with a propaganda machine or using dirty tricks. He's self-made and he's well-paid. To many ghetto kids, that's a heavenly mix. These times, come the next election, Museveni's 76. <laughs> but there is something granddad like about him. That's why so many can't imagine life without him. He represents the familiar. George, I'm going to go straight to some questions and some thoughts from YouTube for you. This is Timothy. As a Ugandan, the adage black, yellow, red seems not to resonate with the masses. Given the current state in Uganda, it is sickening having to wake up to traumatizing headlines within and across Uganda. George, thoughts? It is um, sickening and it is disturbing um, across the diaspora as well, which is why I feel that through my platform, um, I can provide space for all who are interested in the future of Uganda to reflect and to take stock of both sides of the argument um, and what the opportunities for us might look like moving forward and, look and, move and looking beyond politics, frankly. What was your experience, and this is from YouTube again, shooting the visuals in Uganda? Some were shot in Uganda, some were not. Uh, explain the filming process. Great question. So we actually did um, film quite a lot in Uganda. That was my second time filming in Uganda. 
My first time was a few years before. I created a music video with the director Isaac Oboth and the producer Kemiondo Coutinho, very talented people. That was great. But this time, this was with a director called Meji Alabi. Meji is a British Nigerian. He does like all the big Afrobeats um, videos, music videos. But he's also a friend of mine. And I expressed to him my interest in creating material like this that wasn't just a song but it was also based on the continent i i said to him as soon as i wrote uh the pieces of black yellow red that ended up in the film i said to him we're gonna go out to uganda and we're just gonna do whatever we can when we get there and that's what we did fortunately we were well taken care of in the community of kamocha where we did m most of the filming um shouts out to zex and and the rest of the team uh but yeah, people were very supportive, um, cooperative, excited, and it was a great experience. There are a couple of big issues that you pick up on and you introduce in, in the performance, the film of Black, Yellow, Red. I want to have a listen to Safina. She's a nurse. She's based in Uganda and respond to her thoughts. Elections in Uganda are neither free nor fair. And as long as we do not get a change in leadership, we're never going to experience um, real change and it will never be implemented. Most of our problems stem from this regime, from the leadership that we have, from the decisions that they make. So I um, recognize the the link between the decisions and the habits and the track record of this regime and the lack of progress in some areas of public concern, whether that's healthcare, infrastructure, etc. What I also recognize, and I really want to be respectful here because I'm not on the African continent, but I recognize some patterns. I, re I recognize consistencies with the Ugandan political situation and the, the situation across many countries in, in Africa. Now, when I see these patterns, when I see uh, leaders staying in power for longer than the people expected, longer than they said they would in the first place, when I see them changing the constitution to allow this to happen, when I see young people um, becoming increasingly frustrated and even becoming divided because there are people that do support this regime, when I see these patterns, what I, what, I, um, what I take from these patterns is that Africa needs, to, needs a way of rethinking change, rethinking social change, rethinking development. We as young Africans who are often find ourselves at odds with older leaders and older regimes who will always talk to us about how things were before they were in power and how they are maintaining stability and allowing the economy to expand. We need to figure out how we're not gonna get locked into fruitless arguments with these regimes. And I think we do that already. We might not realize, we might not recognize it in the way that I'm describing, but through our art, through our film, through our music, through our culture, which plugs us into audiences across the world and creates commercial opportunities, as well as broadcasting our experiences between the homeland, the motherland and the diaspora. Through our culture, we have created the biggest opportunity for change that we can imagine. And if we're really ambitious about that opportunity, we can achieve a lot of what we hope polit politics will take care of. See, I hear a cautiousness in your voice. Uh, and this is the cautiousness of, of being in the as diaspora. And, and I can hear people saying, well, you're not in, in Uganda. How, how would you even know? And, and you had an uh, elite education, so it's okay for you to speak about it. And, and I, I, I know that there are those criticisms that come back to maybe bite you. How do you respond to those? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to respect these criticisms because even though I might not want to hear them, there's validity in them. Mm. And I think what, they, what those criticisms indicate is that it can't be up to one person 
one of the frustrate one of the frustrating things about our electoral system and about politics in general is that it becomes so focused on personalities. So many of us um, load all of our hopes into either Museveni or Bobby Wine, where in reality, there is a system at play. This is why I talk about patterns across the continent. There are systems that we just need to be scientific about. We need to be objective about these systems. So if I'm saying that I see similarities in the direction of Ugandan politics with um, the way that um, I don't want to draw direct comparisons with any particular country, but if I'm saying I see similarities, um, what what I have the opportunity to do is try and figure out where I sit in those um, problems. And from a diaspora perspective, the solution or the response that I will offer is that I am at least an audience. I am at least an enjoyer of Ugandan culture. I am at least a young person who participates in Uganda from overseas. And in me, you have an opportunity. And guess what? I'm not the only one. There are many, many young Ugandans and older Ugandans across the diaspora who are passionate about the country's future, who want to make the best contribution they can. Um, otherwise, they will just not be engaging with the future of Africa, will um, commit all of their talents and their resources to whatever country that they've settled in. So I, what I'm saying to anyone who feels that I alone can't speak for the future of Uganda, I'm saying, yeah, but I'm here for you. So you, so talk to me. What can we work on? What can we develop? And the first, uh, the first answer that I can think of is the, the sharing, the broadcasting, the recording, the promotion of our culture. That's what we do in the arts. Mm -hmm. Here on YouTube, Proud by M5 says, what influence has Bobby Wine had on you, George? In the film Black, Yellow, Red, you are critical of Bobby Wine. You point out that popularity doesn't mean that you're good at governing. Yeah, popularity alone is not the same as being good at governing. And I have had to um, recognize that, you know, we don't, we haven't necessarily had evidence Bobby hasn't had the opportunity to show what he could do as a head of state. However, in terms of how Bobby Wine has influenced me, he has reminded me of the importance of speaking truth to power. Bobby Wine has been someone who has um, stood by his beliefs and he has stood by his criticisms, you know, many of them very valid criticisms of the way things are. Before Bobby Wine, that role there was no one prominent in our generation who we, ne who we necessarily identified with. No one was really doing that in the way that Bobby Wine has done. So that really pushed me to start articulating my feelings about Uganda's future, hopefully to motivate other people in the diaspora who might also want to start developing their opinion and their contribution to Uganda. Shivans is a student. He's based in Uganda. He has a question for you. How can we include everyone in this cause for social betterment? And in the aftermath, from a leadership standpoint, once we are the leaders who started this race and included everyone, once we get to that point, how do we ensure that we do not confuse long-term progress for no progress, where we ensure the change is progressive and that we keep an open mind and that we are willing to pass the button on to the next man. Shivansh, that's a great question. Um, and in that question are so many things that we need to, as individuals, we need to continue to apply our energy to thinking about these problems. So one of the things that you identified was that, um, you know, when we do see change and when times move on, how are we going to ensure that we have a system of understanding each other and sharing power and responsibility? And the answer is there is no single answer. On an individual level, every Ugandan, this is what I said at the, at the end of my film, Black, Yellow, Red, Uganda's future is not just in politics alone. It is in the destiny of every Ugandan. So as individuals, we need to first of all accept our social responsibility, 
okay? Unfortunately or fortunately, we don't have central power. We don't have central authority as young Ugandans. There is no, as across the diaspora, and for many people who do not identify with the current leadership, who do not relate to the current leadership, we don't have a single way of communicating. We don't have a single agenda of priorities that we're going to work through. However, we all have a shared passion for Uganda's future. So what that means is that you as an individual, Shivanj, you need to start thinking to yourself, what can I do for my country? Where do my skills lie? Where, what opportunities do I have to connect with people overseas? Overseas Ugandans like George and everyone else that he represents. How can I offer my services, my skills, my, no my knowledge to these people in a way that we can build anything, any opportunity, any commercial um, arrangement, any trade between us that we can control. That's the big project for our generation. George, I'm, I'm looking on YouTube. There are lots of comments, lots of thoughts, uh, and, and lots of thanks for your work. Mutungi says that, I love George. I followed him since school. I took some big decisions in my life based on his ideas. One of the big, powerful ideas that we're left with with Black, Yellow, Red is the impact and the effectiveness of music as a force for change. Have a look, have a listen, everybody. So what are you saying, there's no hope? Maybe not with politics, but music? Even with seven, he knows the power of music. Yeah? Yeah, come on. Music's a great way of making us think. Look, it's given us so many ways of making a drink. We got the juice, innit? Come on. <laughs> and we won't stop producing it. Do you understand what I'm saying to you, cousin? Yeah. All over the world. Say this all the time, cousin. We got the Brother, juice. all over the world is the most common beverage. It's real talk. And that's given us a lot of leverage, a lot of privilege, a lot of heritage. <laughs> but all of this comes from the streets. Yet we still can't save our daughters and sons from the streets. We got famous artists walking with guns on the streets and food still runs the alternate funds on the streets. We want our music to be our savior from all of this self-destructive behavior. But it's just a soundtrack to what's really happening. All the issues that we're not really tackling. So when George and I were, were chatting about this show, it was really obvious that he wanted to be able to help. It's like, how do I help people? And one of the ways that he is doing this with his art, with his work, is he's taking a PhD. And there's something about right. this PhD, this topic, this subject, where he's, he's like, this is going to help young Ugandans. This is going to help the African diaspora. George, can you, can you mm -hmm. make the connections between what you're doing with your PhD and how you feel you can help the African diaspora and young people around the world who are struggling with how do they help their own country to thrive? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking about this, Femi. Well, ultimately, what I'm trying to understand with my research is how young black people for 100 years from all corners of the world have come up with their own ways of making music that have gone on to be really commercially successful without changing the um, prospects of the communities that they come from. I don't see how it's possible. I don't see how we can um, have, you know, young black people, not just Ugandans, black people, for as long as we've had access to recording equipment, there's been jazz, there's been rock and roll, there's been R&B, there's been reggae, there's been hip hop, there's been funk, soul, disco, uh, grime, African music. Now we have Afro beats, now uh, dance hall, reggae, all of these things came from young black people in very similar situations to what I grew up in and to what many young Ugandans are currently growing up in. But sure. real innovation came from their music and real change came from their music and real money was made from their music. Now, Uganda is one of those countries that has a music scene that is more prominent than other countries with a bigger population sure. on the continent, mm -hmm. right? So there's an George, opportunity there. 
George, it's been a pleasure talking to you and sharing you with our YouTube audience and our audience around the world on multiple platforms. One more thing I have to do, have a look at my laptop, everybody. Black, Yellow, Red is currently available for you to watch on YouTube. You can also follow George the Poet on Twitter. And of course, have you heard George's podcast? If you haven't, you can do it where you find all good podcasts. George the Poet, thanks for joining us on the stream this week. Thank you very much. Take care.